Assalamualaikum everyone. This is Rahat Sabah, Head of Lecture Series and Collaborations at the Legislation and Policy Clinic by Adil or Sehat. Salal is my associate um, who has assisted me throughout to arrange this webinar and I thank him for his hard work. Um, it's the first episode of our lecture series um, where we would try to understand workplace harassment and its scope. The distinguished speaker for our lecture today is uh, Ms. Elspeth Graham. She's a Canadian lawyer who has been addressing workplace harassment with two legal clinics um, in Ontario. She's currently uh, leading the sexual harassment in the workplace project at the Elgin Oxford Legal Clinic and the Huron Perth Community Legal Clinic with funding uh, from the Department of Justice Canada. Um, she also works as a legal researcher at Bolter AI, a Montreal-based uh, artificial intelligence company focused on misconduct and harassment detection in the workplace and wider society. It's truly an honor to have you here, Elspeth. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be joining you here today. Likewise, um, co-hosting the webinar with me uh, is Ms. Ms. Victoria Mersely. She's working as a public educator and a project coordinator on the sexual harassment in the workplace project at Community Legal Assistance, Cernia. It's a pleasure to have you here, Victoria. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I'm so excited to be here. Same here. All right, so I will um, start the session by asking some fundamental questions about workplace harassment from Elspeth. Um, so my first question um, from you, Elspeth, is what do you think qualifies as workplace harassment and what are the various types of workplace harassment? Right, so this is an important question for us to start with, and I'm going to give you a typical lawyer response here and say that it depends. So it really does depend on who you ask and where we are and what definition we're using when we're talking about workplace harassment. So for example, even in Canada, we're going to have different definitions of what exactly that means. So at the federal level, at the country level for Canada, we have legislation that defines harassment and violence as any action, conduct, or comment, including of a sexual nature, that can reasonably be expected to cause offense, humiliation, or other physical or psychological injury or illness to an employee. Then at the provincial level, so in our province of Ontario, we have legislation as well that specifically defines workplace harassment as engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct against a worker in a workplace that is known or ought reasonably to be known to be unwelcome or a second option of workplace sexual harassment, which then has its own definition. So really we can look at it in the context of these different, different definitions, but the common points that we really see are that it can include a range of behaviors. So it can be an act, it can be a comment, it can even be an attitude or behavior towards someone. And the main issue here is that it's causing some sort of harm. So it's causing um, or it could reasonably be expected to cause harm that is physical, psychological, um, economic, or otherwise. So, you know, we can think about it in terms of the more obvious forms of harassment. So where we see something physical taking place, but there can also be the more subtle types of harassment where we have something like a joke or a comment. And really, I think the best way to think about it is we have this umbrella term. So we have workplace violence and harassment. That's our umbrella, that's our general broad term. And then within that, we can have different types of harassment. And that would include things like bullying or workplace sexual harassment. Um, that was a very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Elspeth. And I think um, the psychological aspect um, of workplace harassment that you talked about, that's something that is particularly lacking, uh, not just in the Pakistan Pakistani society, but also in the legislation. So it's really important to incorporate that, in, incorporate that concept uh, when you're making reforms. Um, so under the workplace harassment law in Pakistan, only sexual harassment is recognized. So workplace harassment claim can only be brought forward when you are sexually harassed. Do you think that such an understanding of harassment um, is a legitimization of how men perceive harassment? 
Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And I think that there's a few different things at play here. So one, I think, is that globally, we've seen a huge increase in understanding and awareness about workplace sexual harassment specifically. So I know your legislation uh, is from 2010, which predates the real rise of the hashtag MeToo movement. But for a number of years, we've seen people come to the understanding that sexual violence in general is absolutely not okay. And when we have that type of violence in a workplace, that similarly is unacceptable. So I think there's just a, a global understanding that this form of workplace harassment is not okay and needs to be addressed. I think another factor that could be at play here is that in a lot of workplaces, bullying and other forms of harassment, these types of behaviors or attitudes can sometimes be seen as a positive thing. So having you know, a very aggressive attitude can sometimes be linked to, in some people's minds, success in business or in work. And so by seeing it in that way, it's a lot harder to say that these attitudes that very traditionally have been seen as things that are a positive in the workplace are actually a, a problem and could qualify as harassment and should be looked at in that way. Another factor that we could have at play here is that, you know, as humans, we all have biases. Um, and when we look at these behaviors, very stereotypically, they've been associated with men. So we're looking at things like a domineering attitude, being blunt, being aggressive, these are typically associated with men in a stereotypical way. And because of these biases that we all have, if you're in a position of power and you have this belief that those types of attitudes are positive, that they're a good sign of a, a good leader or a good business person, then when you're in a position of power, that bias can affect the way that you make decisions. So when you have decision makers who see these behaviors as a positive thing, it's going to be very difficult for them to overcome that bias and see the importance of addressing things like bullying and workplace harassment as being just as important as the specific form of workplace sexual harassment. Right, um, that was very um, eye-opening aspect. Um, so in your earlier response, you did um, hint at the fact that, you know, it's really not easy to define harassment. It's a subjective experience. Um, but, you know, when, when we are legislating, we do have to define workplace harassment. So in your opinion, how should the law define workplace harassment in a way that, that would try its best to, to, for it to be an all encompassing definition to incorporate the idea that harassment in effect is a subjective experience. Absolutely. So I think really the goal should be to provide in the beginning as broad a definition as possible. So with the definition that I mentioned from Canada at the federal level, it defines harassment and violence very, very broadly. I think that's a really great place to start because it encompasses everything that we can, like I said, put under this umbrella term of harassment and violence, of workplace harassment and violence. And then from there, what we can do is create further definitions of different types of workplace violence and harassment. So a definition specifically for workplace sexual harassment within that broader context, I think would be very helpful. Right, uh, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so my next two questions are kind of related. Um, so if you want, you can handle them collectively. Um, can the workplace harassment be treated as a human rights issue in terms of attacking the right to work with dignity? And can it be seen as an equalities issue if it predominantly affects women? Absolutely. I, I think this is a really important question again, um, because we do know that workplace harassment and workplace sexual harassment can happen to anyone at any time, but we definitely do also see patterns and trends in who it does affect predominantly. And so we see with sexual violence in general, we see that affecting women globally more than it does men. In Canada, uh, with workplace harassment in general, we see that it affects women more than it does men. 
and of course, so too workplace sexual harassment. And you know, interestingly, I think we do also have to consider that there are other groups beyond just uh, the binary gender divide of, of women and men who are going to be more affected by this as well. So whether they're not necessarily affecting or uh, experiencing it at higher rates, we do also have to consider the fact that certain people are going to have issues with reporting. They might feel less likely to be believed. They might feel less safe reporting. They might receive a different response when they do report, you know, based on who they are. So for example, if we're looking within the group of women, we might have in Canada, black women, indigenous women, women of color who experience further inequity in general. And then when they do experience workplace harassment, workplace sexual harassment, the complications of the multiple forms of discrimination that they experience affects the way that they experience this issue of workplace harassment, as well as being able to respond to it. So we, we tend to see issues of discrimination and harassment overlap. And in Canada, we, in addition to considering workplace harassment a health and safety issue, which it absolutely is, and something that employers need to look to prevent as well as address when it does happen. But we do also look at it as a human rights issue. So in uh, Canada, discrimination and harassment in employment is prohibited. And it's prohibited on a certain specified number of grounds. So we see that, uh, for example, with respect to race, with respect to religion, gender, age, disability, so when we have harassment overlapping with discrimination and occurring in that context, it absolutely is a human rights issue. And interestingly, so the International Labor Organization, the United Nations agency that sets international standards for labor, um, they recently uh, issued a convention, convention number 190, that recognizes the right of everyone to a world of work free from violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment. And I think that that's really important. And in the convention, they specifically say that violence and harassment in the world of work can constitute a human rights violation or abuse. And violence and harassment is a threat to equal opportunities and is unacceptable and incompatible with decent work. So this is a very recent convention. It came into force in June of this year. It has not yet been ratified by either Canada or Pakistan, but any countries that do ratify it would be required to put into place the laws and policies and procedures necessary to prevent workplace harassment and violence as a human rights abuse. So I do think there's definitely a push, you know, in Canada and internationally to view workplace harassment as a human rights issue, as it absolutely does affect our right to work. Um, interesting, I feel uh, it's, it's a very interesting lens through which we can view workplace harassment. And uh, you mentioned how there are groups beyond the gender, gender binary of men and women who do experience workplace harassment. And it's particularly important in the context of Pakistan because we are far, far from incorporating the transgender community in the workplace harassment law and the added issue is that most of the work um, is in informal spaces and that's something that we'll come back to later on. Um, so my next question is uh, that, you know, you have, have, have had a lot of experience dealing with uh, harassment cases. What advice would you give to people who feel that they are being harassed at the workplace? What actions should they take? Yeah, so again, this is this is such an important question because so often I think people experience something like this and then have no idea what to do next. So my number one recommendation would be to document everything. Do your best to take notes on what's happening, you know, important dates, uh, events, times, that sort of thing, what was said, what happened. Try to take these notes so that you have this for yourself. So if at some point you do decide to report or to take further steps, you have this basic information and evidence ready to go. And you know, ideally this is something that you would keep on your own personal um, 
device or, you know, in your own possession, as opposed to, you know, leaving it in your, your work computer or your work files, that sort of thing. Um, next, I would recommend look at, look for any guiding documents. So in Canada, employers have an obligation to have a specific workplace policy addressing workplace violence and workplace harassment. So for Canadian employees, it would be important to go and look at your employer's policy, look at how they define workplace harassment, does what happened to you fall within that definition, and also that policy should outline the procedures for reporting any sort of harassment. So that would be kind of your uh, guide to what to do next. From there, um, I think, you know, you can take a look at if your employer doesn't have a policy, take a look at what resources are available um, out there in the world to help you understand the relevant legislation. Obviously, not everyone has legal training, so that can be very difficult to do. Um, the law can be very confusing, you know, especially when we use legalese in, in our legislation that makes it hard for people to understand what exactly we're talking about here. Um, so look for resources out there. And there's a lot of really interesting, innovative work being done to increase access to justice and to help people understand legislation without a legal background. So, for example, I also have a role working as a legal researcher with Botler AI, as you mentioned. Um, and so they're an artificial intelligence company that uses technology to help develop solutions for people to address misconduct in the workplace and in society in general. So they have one product that's Botler for Citizens, and that's available to um, you know, Canadian, Ontarian citizens to use this and to try to figure out if what happened to them qualifies as harassment, if it might be harassment. And then what do they do from there? What next steps can they take? What resources can they get connected with? And this platform, helps them do that so they can get connected and I definitely encourage you to do so because that's how you'll get your best understanding of what the law is, what your rights are, and what your employer's obligations are. And, you know, in Canada and, and in Ontario especially, we have a really strong legal clinic system that provides people with legal advice for free. Um, and so typically this is for people who have lower income in order to increase access to justice. In the project that Victoria and I are working on specifically, we provide free legal advice and information to anyone of any income with respect to sexual harassment in the workplace. So there are options out there in the world um, that can make legal advice more affordable and more accessible to you. So I definitely encourage people to look for those options. Great. And yeah, no, no. Um, finally, my, my, my last recommendation would be to report. And, and I, I know that this is not always the right choice for everyone or, or possible, you know, if you don't feel safe uh, doing so, then obviously, you know, that's an important consideration. But by reporting, you know, you're, you're saying that you're not okay with what's happening, and you're taking steps to put an end to it. And really, I think that's the number one thing that most people want is they just want the harassment to stop. And sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't until you take steps to address it, either by reporting or, or maybe even quitting, unfortunately. Um, all right. Great piece of advice, Elspeth. And um, the work that your clinics are doing, uh, I cannot stress enough how important of a work is being done and how important and crucial it is, given how rampant workplace harassment is. Um, and also the, the artificial intelligence company, Border AI, again, it's something that um, we can take lessons from, we can follow the footsteps to uh, make justice more accessible here in Pakistan too. Um, so my next question is kind of an extension of my previous question and um, it concerns career risks. So many cases of workplace harassment are concerning management level employees or employees under them. And therefore, um, the victims of harassment at this point, they particularly feel vulnerable um, and do not cannot muster up the courage to you know, report the harassment. 
So what policies should be in place um, at the workplace to ensure victims carry a safety? Yeah, so unfortunately that, that is the reality and, and a big reason why a lot of the time people don't report is because you know they don't feel safe doing so for a number of reasons, including the threat to their career, especially if it's a manager, a supervisor who has power over them. That, that power dynamic is very important because if they feel like it, their career will be affected in any way, if they feel they might be fired, then how can they feel safe to report? So the number one thing that I would recommend to assist with this is when we're building workplace policies as you know, employers, as organizations, that we're sure to include in that policy that any good faith report of workplace harassment will not be punished. So you're spelling out in your policy that that is not behavior that will be tolerated and that if someone does report, they can't be punished for that. And obviously the good faith element is important. You know, if someone is falsely reporting, which doesn't happen all that often, but of course it still can happen. So if someone doesn't report in good faith, that could affect someone else in a, a substantial way. But most of the time reporting is in good faith and it shouldn't be punished. And that's something that should be very, very clear in the policy. And it's something that uh, the leaders in the organization should really demonstrate a commitment to. So it shouldn't be just in the policy. They have to actually follow the policy um, when these things come up. So ensure that those people reporting are protected um, and they're not suffering any sort of con consequences or, or punishments from the manager. Um, so it has to be words and actions from leaders and from employers to support that. Right. Uh, very rational and insightful suggestions. Just to follow up, when you say good faith complaint, um, do we also have to make provisions um, for a situation where you are reporting, but you're unable to prove harassment? What if that falls in you know, bad faith reporting? Right. So that would be an important term to define uh, in some way in your policy, right? So what does it mean to report in good faith? It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't don't have any evidence to support your report or to support your claim of, of what happened to you. It means that you're not maliciously coming and making this report knowing that nothing happened. So you're, you're making up a scenario in order to maybe try to get someone in trouble. So that, that would be bad faith where your intentions with the reporting are um, negative as opposed to reporting something that happened to you Maybe it's, it's just your word against someone else's. If your intention in reporting is to report something that you truly believed happened and violated your rights in any way, then, then that's in good faith. All right, um, makes complete sense. Um, so Elspeth, last question from my side. Um, in the context of Pakistan, the definition of workplace um, does not cover informal workplaces. In your opinion, how should the law define um, the workplace, considering that some workplaces do not have an organizational structure, uh, especially the recent Zoom or Google workplaces and also um, freelance work? Absolutely. So the pandemic has really brought to our attention how fluid the idea of a workplace is. It, you know, it's, it's not just this physical office space, this building, this factory that we have maybe traditionally thought of it as. All of, a lot of people have been working from home. Um, so we do have to take that into consideration. And in Ontario, our health and safety legislation has defined workplace, um, which I think is important, um, as any land, premises, location, or thing at, upon, in, or near which a worker works. So um, again, we have that legalese in a way of, you know, just kind of complicating it, but we can really break that down to mean essentially anywhere where there's a sufficient connection to the workplace, to work that's being done. So you have an employee who's working from home. They're connected to the workplace by, you know, logging into their laptop, logging into their email and having communications with other people who are a part of that workplace. So, you know, we have to really think about the workplace broadly um, and ensure that we're defining it in that way to ensure that all these different scenarios are captured and 
as time goes on, you know, it might evolve further. So having that broad definition really helps to capture a number of different settings. So, you know, we have the physical space, but we also have things like company parties or, or retreats or professional education and training sessions, or even a, a supplier going to meet with a client at their office or at their residence, even, you know, situations like that definitely happen or our virtual work communications. So having that broad understanding and broad definition of what is the workplace, I think is truly more reflective of the reality of work today. Oh, indeed. Uh, and I must say, um, compared to what we have in Pakistan, the definition of workplace in Ontario is, is really simple, straightforward, and way more broad as well. Um, thank you so much for extremely insightful and enlightening responses, Elspeth. I would now like to hand over to Victoria to ask her questions. Thank you so much. And Elspeth, I've worked with you for months, but I still learn so much whenever you whenever you speak. This is great. Um, so the first question, and I think one of the helpful questions for people who are watching the webinar is, give us a little bit of background on the project, how or why it started, what the overall goals are, and how you're working to, to achieve those goals. Absolutely. So the project, as we've mentioned, is funded by the Department of Justice Canada. And it was funded um, really with the aim of addressing workplace sexual harassment specifically. So that's been our focus. Obviously, all forms of harassment and violence in the workplace are important, but I believe our federal government saw that this was a real issue that Canadians were experiencing and that something needed to be done about it. So this funding was provided to our project, which is throughout the province of Ontario, and it operates through the legal clinics uh, within our province. So two of those legal clinics are the Elgin Oxford uh, Legal Clinic and the Huron Perth Community Legal Clinic. So those are the two that I'm working with. And there are, um, I think, about 22 other legal clinics throughout the province who are part of this project. And really, the project exists to both prevent workplace sexual harassment, as well as to respond to it. So there's a preventative and a reactive piece of the work that we do. So for the preventative piece, what we're really doing is trying to raise awareness and educate about what is workplace sexual harassment? How do we identify it? How do we understand what this is? And so we do that in a number of different ways. So um, a lot of us use social media to raise awareness and provide public legal education in that way on those platforms. But we do also provide free training and workshops to any interested organizations for free. So that way we're able to educate employees about, again, what is workplace sexual harassment and what are employees' rights and employers' obligations relevant to it. And then with respect to the reactive piece of the work that we're doing, that is really our legal advice piece. So we are able to provide free legal advice and information to individuals who have experienced workplace sexual harassment or who maybe have questions about something that they've experienced. So if we want to sum up the goal really of our project is to both increase access to justice in relation to workplace sexual harassment, as well as to help shift and change the reality of workplace sexual harassment and, and make it less likely to occur. That's great. Thank you so much, Elspeth. I think that gives us a really good background on what the project is, what we're aiming to do, and importantly, the context that it arose out of. Um, something that I do want to know is how has the community, and I know that the legal clinics have their own specific communities, but how has your community responded to the project? Have they been really open to it? Um, what's been the general feedback you've received? Yeah, so it's been interesting and challenging to essentially start this project in the midst of the pandemic. So our community out outreach efforts in that way are limited in a sense, um, because we're, we're not able to go around and knock on doors and, and be really visible in the community in that in-person way that we might have liked to be. Um, so we're resorting more to digital spaces and, and that sort of thing. Um, and from my experience with my clinics so far, 
really we've received a lot of support and interest from other community organizations, which I think is fantastic. And so these community organizations are, you know, like-minded to some extent. They're working on similar issues. They're nonprofits. They're service providers. They're passionate about helping the community. And so they see us as someone who is trying to do the same thing. And so they're interested in supporting us and the work that we're doing. And interestingly, those organizations have been uh, some of the most common to take up our uh, service in the form of free training um, and workshops. So that's that's been wonderful. But I do hope that as, you know, as the project continues, as our presence both you know, online and in the real world develops and grows that we're able to increase our um, community reach and the interest and support that we're receiving throughout the community. Absolutely. And I think that's a very common theme. Our uptake in, in Sarnia has mostly been with community organizations as well who are um, aware of sexual harassment in the workplace, are endeavoring to do something about it, but maybe don't have the resources to, to get training. Um, so our project comes at a very good time. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, I think that's something that's a common theme across multiple clinics. But that kind of piggybacks off my next question. And if if it's the exact same answer that you just gave, that's totally fine. But what has been the biggest challenge um, in doing this project and or trying to get it off the ground? Yeah, so related, but to kind of expand on it, um, the pandemic context, I would say, has been the biggest challenge. And so, as I mentioned, it has limited us in terms of what we can do. You know, we can't provide in-person training in the way that we would absolutely love to. Um, but more than that, I think the pandemic has really created a situation where people have so much that they're already dealing with um, that the thought of, you know, discussing or, or addressing the issue of workplace sexual harassment becomes very difficult, uh, even more difficult than it would be under, let's say, normal situ or normal circumstances. So I think a lot of the time people have reached capacity in, in terms of the difficult topics that they can take on and, and think about. So I think there's a bit of a challenge there in terms of getting people interested in talking about this issue and working on addressing it. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm so grateful for this webinar today, because to have an opportunity to, to meet with people and to speak about this issue, meet with like-minded folks who are equally passionate about addressing it, it's, it's really fantastic and it's such a pleasure. Yeah, especially in the international context, right? There is like very global perspectives, there's localized perspectives. And when we have a chance to have those two converge, it's really exciting for, for anybody who's working on this kind of area. So obviously this has been a time full of learning opportunities. This is a project that um, we get to really actively build ourselves. So what has been a really big learning opportunity for you and then kind of had your yeah, so I think um, really what's what's made a difference for me is learning that um, people don't necessarily understand uh, the scope of workplace harassment. So when we think about workplace sexual harassment, what we think about tends to be the most obvious forms. And so to have uh, this understanding that it's really more than that, I think that is really what is going to make such a difference in addressing all of it together. So having people understand that, you know, it's, it's not just unwanted sexual contact, it can be things like comments and jokes. And really that gets to the essence of the problem when we can actually understand the full range of behaviors and the full scope. And so working with people and seeing them kind of have that click like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I, I understand that it, it kind of goes beyond what I thought initially. That's been really fantastic. And, and that's just reaffirmed for me that we have to focus on expanding people's understanding, expanding their definition of what it is. Um, for example, in Ontario, the definition of workplace sexual harassment includes, you know, vexatious comment conduct based on sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And so that, that's a whole area that people um, are starting to understand, but really the more that we kind of expand that understanding, the better. 
and uh, I think it'll really improve the whole effort with respect to workplace harassment and workplace sexual harassment in general. Yeah, absolutely. That piece about sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression um, has become like the full the fulcrum of a lot of my presentations because I think it forms this basis for people to understand like what we mean when we say things are a spectrum, what we mean when things are comment or conduct, both taken seriously, grounding it in those protected grounds really opens people's eyes. And I think it's uh, great that the definition really grounds itself in those in those social locations because um, it's a it's a tool to help people understand what it looks like in everyday life. Um, and you're right, that moment where people go, I did not know that was sexual harassment. It's such a it's such a good moment because you realize you've expanded people's understanding. So absolutely. Um, so obviously this is a five-year funded project. Um, different clinics have joined at different times. What is a challenge for a project like this that is only funded for a limited number of years? Um, and how do we plan for when the project comes to an end? Yeah, so, you know, and there is a challenge when you have that kind of defined time limit of, uh, you know, there will be an end to the project and, and how do we get everything done that we want to in that time. Um, there's certainly a challenge there and it, it can limit what we do to some extent, but I think there's also an opportunity there that's really exciting in that we can think about okay, what can we develop? What can we do with the time that we have? And, you know, it might seem like a short time, but I think there's still a lot that we can get done um, even in a short time. But what can we do with that time to create things and to develop and shift and move the conversation to a place that people will benefit from it after the fact? So what are we building? What are we leaving behind as, as our legacy, essentially, when this project is over? So that's a challenge, but it's also a really exciting opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and my last question, um, and it might be a big one, but it's what advice would you give to a community organization or a number of community organizations who are looking to launch a similar project either on workplace harassment more broadly, sexual harassment specifically, but a similar kind of um, set of goals and ways of getting those goals? Yeah, so one of the things that I have found to be absolutely essential in the work that I'm doing is collaboration. So whether that's collaborating with people within the project at different legal clinics, collaborating with people within my legal clinics that I'm working with, other organizations, community organizations, service providers, uh, you know, even collaborating with organizations internationally like this, which is absolutely fantastic. So that has really been such an important and, and essential piece of the work that I've been able to do. And I think that my advice would be to pursue those opportunities as much as possible, because I think when we're able to collaborate and, and work together, it strengthens not only the work that we're doing, but the impact of that work. So that would definitely be my, my number one piece of advice to, to anyone trying to work on issues like this, projects like this, is uh, collaboration. And with respect to public legal education in general, I think some key points to keep in mind are you know, access to justice. As, as I've mentioned throughout this webinar, the law can be really complicated. It can be confusing and it can be intimidating. And a lot of people might not feel like they have access to it. So if we can, through our public le legal education, increase that access, then that's absolutely a good thing. Um, you know, empowering people to seek justice and on their own terms, right? So knowing the different options and, and pursuing what's right for them, I think that that is absolutely essential work. And to get involved in it is really important and, and understanding the different people who are impacted by these and others and, and how we can uplift Great. and empower Thank them. Thank you so much, Elspeth. That over to my co-host. Uh, take it away. 
Thank you, Victoria. Um, a very important questions. Um, the work that sexual harassment in the workplace is doing um, is amazing, providing access to justice at the grassroots level. And, you know, in, in the challenges that you're facing in the opportunities that you're creating in the capacity that you're building in each of these things, um, that there is something that we can take away for clinics like us. Um, there, there's a lot to learn from. Um, and when you talked about challenges, you know, there, there are plenty of them that um, we can also relate to. Um, and I have been working at a quasi-judicial body at the federal level that deals with workplace harassment cases. And some of the challenges that you just mentioned are, you know, completely relatable here as well. Uh, again, um, you know, every now and then we realize the global nature of this issue. And it's important that we collaborate, take international perspective, look at it subjectively, objectively, you know, from multiple lenses. Um, and it was very eye-opening. Um, when you talked about within sexual harassment, you know, there it's a whole spectrum. The, the broad scope of uh, sexual harassment itself uh, is something that we can truly learn from as well. Um, so that's the end of today's webinar. Um, I don't know, I feel like I, I want to keep it on and, you know, talk more about, about this issue with you because it's so enlightening. Uh, there's so much that we can learn from you. Uh, thank you so much, Elspeth and Victoria, for taking out your valuable time and uh, joining us in this endeavor to create awareness um, and bring reforms around workplace harassment. Um, again, the preventative aspect of um, the works that you know a lot of clinics do to create awareness, uh, it's so important. And again, um, I've been learning a lot uh, from what you just said. Thank you both of you for your valuable time. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much for having us. It's it's really been such a pleasure to work with everyone here on your team. Likewise, likewise, it's an honor to have you both here. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, when it um, goes on air, again the community will learn a lot. As a clinic, we will learn a lot, and our policymakers will learn a lot. So I thank you so much for this. Thank you it's so much pleasure. for having us. Um, Pleasure. All right. Goodbye, Elspeth, Victoria. Okay. Bye. We'll talk soon.